five now. Thank you, ladies. Let's see, we were, let's put Linda at the top of our list this morning of mention. Pray for, uh, saw uh, Henry yesterday. He was here at the church at the same time that I was. Uh, he was doing some things in preparation for today. But I did speak by text with Linda, and she said there, the heart procedures that she went through uh, were an improvement to her heart difficulty. So continue to pray for Linda Crow. Uh, Ned and Betsy are out west. That's what I was going to ask, if they're still out there. They're going to stay there and not come back till the last day of December. So keep them in your prayers. Conti I, uh, Sunday before last, I'll have to keep, keep making mental adjustments. I haven't missed a Sunday but just being out entirely for a long time. Sunday before last, last we were here after everyone had left, or most everyone had left, and uh, Vicki Black came by. She's a former member of our church, has visited a few times here this year, but her, her husband passed away of, uh, he'd been suffering from dementia for very long time and uh, he passed away on Thanksgiving. Vicki Black and she is uh, she came by to talk. She was she is uh, I think she and Linda Crow had worked together before and in, uh, in banking and so she came by and was able to talk with her. It was a pleasant day so we sat on a bench outside and talked for a while. Um, Uh, Liz Bain was under the weather. She didn't go to work on Friday at the bank, but she's here today. Says she's feeling better. Um, her two sisters and brother-in-law are showing some improvement. At least they're better. A couple of weeks ago, she, her, she has a one of her sisters has been treating for, treated for cancer. The other had a stroke. Her, their names are Ina and Helen. Helen's husband's name is Jerry. Fine people. Um, I have a prayer warrior that I've printed. It's uh, got more uh, uh, detail in it. I uh, got a text from Ronnie Reeves saying that he and Karen both tested positive for COVID-19. Oh, my goodness. So, uh, also... So, they won't be at church either then, no. will they? Uh, their son, Austin, and daughter-in-law, Morgan, are both tested positive. Uh, oh, my goodness. They had, uh, they're the ones with the new baby that was born yeah, yeah. seven or eight months ago, and uh, his name is Rhett. They said that he is clear right now, so I, uh, he, he, may be, he may already have built up his immunity, and uh, let's pray for Rhett, though, as well. No, no news uh, from Andrew and Victoria, if they have been in contact or not, but it might be a good time to stay away from family for a while. But uh, remember the Reeves family. Uh, last I spoke with Danny Ward, he said that he his doctor wanted to do a surgery on the, uh, some uh, discs in his neck, and I don't I haven't heard if he's had that surgery or not. If he's had it and is recovering, or if he did, he's kept it very quiet. But if he hasn't had it, let's pray that it goes well. If he's suffering from back pain or neck pain, that's difficult. Maybe we can find out a little bit more about that today. That's one of the things that I regret about being sick. It really kind of puts me out of uh, circulation sometimes. Uh, and knowing how to... I know that I can't mingle with people or be of assistance if needed, so I just kind of stay under the radar. We do pray for all the people in uh, Kentucky and the, the area that were just ravaged by the tornadoes. Um, we, uh, I hadn't been out of the house much at all except to go to the doctor all last week and went out Friday night and uh, the last time I had stepped out it had been cold. I need to wrap up. I think it felt like it was a summer day when I stepped out. It was just hot. Um, so
So that is what makes for a tornado. All of this cold weather, the, uh, these warm and cold fronts collide, and that causes the, the problem. Well, let's pray, and we'll look a little bit more at Ezekiel. I, I agree with uh, Barbara that uh, the book of Ezekiel is a strange book, and uh, there are parts of Daniel that are that tell a, a wonderful narrative story, almost kind of like an epic uh, adventure. But then, uh, then Daniel gets off into prophecy, and it all sounds very wild and woolly. But let's pray for the people that we've mentioned on our list. I feel and fear that I may have overlooked someone's or list or name, but we'll perhaps pick those up during our worship service. I'm not. I want to mention to the folks uh, that are viewing from home this morning that we're not going to be broadcasting. We're having the 11 o'clock service. Will be we'll be observing the Lord's Supper, so I'm not going to broadcast that. We. It's kind of a, a, a private ceremony always. We have broadcast them in the past, but uh, it's only because it hadn't occurred to me that uh, it might be something that we need to do more in-house. Certainly can't share the elements with you uh, electronically, and so there's a, a, only a limited way that you can participate. And so just to be able to be an observer is, uh, is, is not enough and maybe too much. If that's all you are, you never want to be just an observer or just a, a hearer, be a doer of the word, be involved, be be a, be a part of the process. Let's let's pray and then we'll look at some pat some of the passages in our uh, lesson today in the book of Ezekiel. Father, I want to thank you for your goodness to us and thank you for the privilege of being in your house and with your people. Your blessings upon Joanne and especially if she uh, is required to see a another specialist about her ear. We, we thank you that that possibility is available and pray that you would uh, see to the issues that she's facing. We do thank you for Barbara and Henry and we uh, thank you for the safety of their family in Kentucky and yet our heart goes out to all of those who lost loved ones and who lost property in, in the devastation of the tornadoes of this week. We've prayed for people who have lost loved ones during this holiday season, those who are sick, who've had surgeries or sent pending surgeries. We pray for um, our members uh, far and wide sometimes who tune in. Um, we thank you for those who are able to listen in and to uh, there are some of our members that are in faraway places and I pray that you would let them know that they are always on your mind and often on ours. We ask you to lead us as we study your word this morning and teach us something that we need to know that will draw us closer to you. And we ask it, Lord, in your name. Amen. Um, searching through my brain. Um, <laughs> not too much medication, I guess. Let's, let's, the book of Ezekiel. The Old Testament, any books of the Old Testament have to be approached with uh, with a great deal of understanding of background and context. Um, most of the Jewish people that I have known or talked to or had an opportunity to talk to are offended by, of course, from the very beginning of us referring to their scriptures as our scriptures. They don't see the writings of the of Moses and the prophets as being an old anything. Well, they're old. They're they're old writings. But the Old Testament, they don't uh, know. It. It, the Old Testament implies the words Old Testament implies that there's a New Testament, and of course, Jewish people never uh, accepted Jesus of Nazareth as the promised Messiah, and so. Most of our interpretations about the Old Testament are in relation to our understanding of Jesus. Uh, in the book of Romans, Paul even talks about the first Adam and describes Jesus as the second Adam. In other words, that Adam and Eve were like the beginning of mankind. But Jesus was a new beginning. So that's taking... Uh, the only writings are the major writings that we have about Adam and Eve are from the books of Moses and Genesis about Adam and Eve in the first, uh, in the second, third chapter uh, spoken about their creation. 
And so you can see how Christians have said, well, uh, there, we can look, we look at Adam and Eve on one hand and Jesus and we see a correlation. Hebrew people would say, well, no, there's no correlation at all. Um, to us, Christians, the existence of the Jewish people their history and their story uh, doesn't make any sense to us unless the ultimate result was the coming of Jesus. Well, we, we see that uh, it, it's not only the way we've been taught, but it, it is something that apart from what I was taught, what I have read for myself and what I see in the study of the Old Testament, that it appears that God was doing something. He was up to something. He was, he was headed in a certain direction. It's a story about someone called the fire department and said, please come quick. Uh, my house is on fire. And they said, well, how do, we, how do we get to your house? And he said, don't you have that red truck? <laughs> Use that. Uh needed an address. God had an address and and uh, because, you see, because of the writings of the Old Testament, what we describe as the Old Testament, people in the ancient world were, were looking for the arrival of someone. So God was, had promised through Ezekiel and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, uh, God is going to send someone who's going to be the focal point of all of this. Now, uh, I think, and it, it is, of course, from my, my bias and my point of view, I think a, a Jewish person today or at any time in history is hard-pressed to explain why Jewish people are special. Why are you special? Well, they, they might tell you, well, we, they think they're special. They think we're God's chosen people. We're unique. We're, God loves us more than he loves anybody else. God has blessed us, and, and uh, we are, but they're, they're really quite ordinary in many regards. Of course, there have been, we could, we could think of great Jewish minds. You know, Albert Einstein was Jewish. We might think of great accomplishments and achievements. I think of their bravery or uh, their great, uh, tremendous historical exploits, uh, and yet, we could, we could take many, uh, do the same thing of the Greeks and the Romans, Egyptians, and great battles, uh, the creation of writing, uh, the advancement of technology and wisdom and understanding, and you know, so many things. I guess that anyone, we hear so much, even, I, I, you know, if you had asked me several years ago, would white supremacy be a great subject of consideration in uh, 2021. I would say, no, surely we, we, we will have handled it and got it in place uh, by then. It seems to be a greatest topic. White supremacy, that white people consider themselves to be supreme, uh, that we are better than other people and that we are more intelligent and we have uh, greater gifts for leadership and administration. Uh, we we're, we're trying. We're trying to uh, make a great statement about which lives matter. Then all the lives matter. Yeah. Well, I've met some lives that I didn't think mattered at all, <laughs> I, and I, I do think that's maybe so even to say all lives matter. I've, I've met some people that I want to say, you know, you're a real loser, and you're uh, you're wasted your whole life, and. Uh, it's, are, are you making a difference? Do you do you real? Are you really doing anything that matters? Maybe that's a, a value judgment that only proud or pretentious people might make. Um, I've met and talked to quite a few Jewish people. I've walked off from one end to the other of the land of Israel and met many Jewish people there. There are more Jewish people, though, I guess, that live in New York City than live in Israel. It's a very small, tiny place. Uh, but 
they have a sense of uniqueness in history. Uh, they're special. And, and even those who are not particularly religious, that they might be consider themselves to be very secular, think of themselves to be a very special and unique people. But I think that what is humbling, and not a, a, an attempt at humiliation or a, a suggestion of a lack of supremacy, is I believe that what may have, has always made the Jewish people special is that God's plan for bringing the Messiah through their line, through their lineage. They were quite a rebellious people uh, in the Bible record. We see that they often uh, forsook God, turned their back on Him, abandoned their faith, worshipped other gods, mixed in and mingled in with the, the populace. Let's look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 8. Let's lead to read a little bit of the scripture right here. In Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 1, it says, It came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, and we're talking about around 590, 592, 97 years before Jesus. Yep. 500 years before Jesus. In the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house... And the elders of Judah sat before me that the, the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. First of all, the early part, these first chapters, we see that Israel is in transition. Many years prior to this, the nation of Israel had separated. They'd had a civil war. And so there was the northern kingdom of Judah. And that's where... Ezekiel is at. It, it comprised, there were 12 tribes, remember, of the Jacob's 12 sons. Judah and Benjamin were the, and Judea were the, the was the country that located around in, Ju, in Jerusalem, the capital. But they had separated completely, separate, set up separate kingdoms. The southern kingdom was called itself Israel. And they were the other ten tribes. So you have, but Israel had already fallen. They had already been devastated. They, uh, the uh, people from the north had come down and completely obliterated the southern kingdom. It was gone. Now you read uh, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah and Jeremiah. They, these prophets were, uh, they came to warn Israel that if they didn't repent that God would punish them and that his punishment would be being overtaken by foreigners so they, they've already gone and so here Judah they have they, they can see it's kind of like so see there and that's kind of a part of Ezekiel's <laughs> message see what happened to Israel well that's going to happen to us and, and nobody wanted to believe that they they uh, they again, I you know I think this thing, and I should have mentioned it a moment ago. When we're thinking about supremacy, uh, I think there's a tendency for every human being to, for me to think that I'm better than other people, that I am closer to God, or that I am smarter, I'm uh, more talented, or I have, I, I'm, I'm a unique person. I think there's something about human <coughs> pride, human. <coughs> hubris that, that makes us, I don't think I feel that way because I'm white. I think I feel that way just simply because I'm a human being. And uh, I, I when I listen to people who say, oh, I want to be equal, I want us to be equal, I, I don't hear anything in their speeches or their words that give me an inclination that they want to be equal. I, it sounds to me like they want to be my superior. I want you to be inferior to me. I, I don't think they're looking for, I don't think they're fighting for equality. I want to have it better than you have it. I want to be in a better position. I want her to be treated better than you're treated. I, you know, uh, and it's all about selfishness. It's not about race, I, I don't think. I don't think it's about uh, true talent or ability or uh, actual intelligence or um circumstance or situation I see in Paul's writings to the Christian church he says you know 
think of other people as better than you are. Because I think the reason he said that in Philippians is because it was contrary to us. We, we naturally look down our noses at everybody. And maybe I, I shouldn't make a statement like that for all of mankind and womankind, but I, I can say that uh, I, I sense those tendencies. Those are the things that I struggle with in my life. I, I don't think I'm better than someone because I'm a different color. I, I just think, I think it's a part of our fallen nature to think of ourselves. And that's what the nature of selfishness is. He says, now, so part of this, the first part of Ezekiel, they're actually in Jerusalem. But as the book goes along, they're going to be invaded. And... Uh, Thousands of them are going to be carried away, captured and carried away. Human history is a, is a history of bondage and slavery. It's, I think it's difficult for any races today. Actually, I heard someone say, and I, I believe it, there's really only one race in the world. It's the human race. But then we have different ethnicities. It might be of a different ethnic origin, different languages, different uh, geographic locations on the globe. But uh, it, it's, it's hard to stand around Jewish people and to bemoan how awful your history has been. When Jewish people start talking about how badly they've been treated, nobody can match their stories. You just read the Old Testament, how many times they were enslaved. and It's, a, uh, it's, it's funny that when Jesus was speaking publicly in, in the New Testament, the, uh, he made some reference about uh, the servitude of their nation of the past. And uh, religious leaders stood up and said, we've never been a served in, servant to anybody. Well, they've actually been a servant to nearly everybody. <laughs> nearly everybody comes in and beats the Jews up. Uh, you know, it, I, it seems almost ludicrous. You start, you talk about the Spanish Inquisition and things like that, and you start looking at the history, like take France or Spain, and it's like some king takes the throne. They say, okay, king, what do you want to do first of all? And he says, well, the very first thing I want to do as king, let's get rid of all the Jews. You know, I think, well, Really? Is that the most pressing thing on your mind? That, that, that's what your agenda is? Yeah, you know, it kind of seems like the thing to do. It's what everybody does. So let's get rid of all the Jews. And I'm thinking, man, so if you're going to stand up and say, oh, me, we've been so mistreated, and then a Jew walks in the room and he says, well, never mind. You know, it's like I was talking about before when people are, are at a dinner party or something talking about all the different wonderful places they've been on vacation. And then Neil Armstrong walks into the room and he says, you know, well, I've, I've been to the moon. It kind of lets the air out of the conversation. <laughs> kind of hard to say, well, I went to Niagara once and I was in California. I went to see the Grand Canyon. He said, yeah, well, I went, I've been on the moon. You know, it's kind of, okay, you win. So... Well, not many people can say that. Well, not many, not many. So here, we're, they're still in Jerusalem. He says, Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire. When someone talks like that, a likeness as, it was like something, and it was as something. You know, they told us in English lit, if it's like or as, then you know you're talking about metaphors or similes. But he's using both words here, as, as the appearance of fire. In the South, we would say, it was kind of like fire. But when someone said, hey, fuzzy head, hey, fuzzy head, come here, let me put you on TV. Let, let me let everybody see you. Let me see. There, there's there's Harper. Hello, Harper. I don't know if you know me with my glasses on or my eyes swollen or not. And there's Mimi. I love your hair. Thanks for coming in. You're welcome. We're on our way to another nursery. <laughs> She's so pretty. Now, why would you care for that? I'll tell you what. She wins my heart. I, uh, I know. i got a few grandkids myself. <laughs> my, my other granddaughters were always happy, but it seems like she wasn't giving that big 
face splitting smile. smile just then, but she smiles more than any baby we've ever had. Anyway, and I'm glad she's happy. Yep, definitely that. So many times when Ezekiel is describing a vision, God let him see things that nobody else could see. And he said, as we would say here in the South, it kind of looked like fire. Come on, man. What does that mean? What is it? It, it, it looked as the likeness or maybe as the appearance of fire. I, what he's really communicating to us in a very real sense is I had no idea what I was looking at. He, and and uh, perhaps with modern terms and technology, we might be able to describe things maybe in a different, a in different, a different way, way than yeah. he did. But he's trying to say, I, God showed me something, and the only thing that came to my mind that it was kind of like fire. <laughs> and we're thinking, you know, it was probably so much more than fire, but uh, God didn't pick someone who had the widest or greatest vocabulary. So this is kind of like fire from the appearance of fire, and from the loins even upward as the appearance of, of brightness. So it kind of it kind of reminded me of bright. As the as the color of amber, that's kind of a yellowish or golden tinge. And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head. He reached out and grabbed me by the hair. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and, and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looked toward the south, where was the seed of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. So he's talking about something there, the something that kind of reminded him of what jealousy looked like. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. And starting here in chapter 8, the glory of God is a phrase that when it was spoken, it would make every Israelite understand that uh, when, when the Israelites... This, the uh, Jewish people were leaving the land of Egypt and Moses was leaving them. God led them by a pillar of fire. And so that was called the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God. And when they set up the tabernacle, that glory, that big pillar of, gigantic pillar of burning, rolling fire would be always over the top of the tabernacle. And so that's really what he's saying that he saw here. But it's at the gate. And, and what you, through the next through two chapters, he's, he's going to, the next place he describes this image, it's going to be a little bit, it's not going to be in the gate anymore. It's going to be in the streets. And, and, and as you read through and you continue on, you see what's happening is, is that the glory of God is leaving Jerusalem. God's headed out of town. Now, Jerusalem is where the temple was. So now we see here, even in the beginning of the vision, it's already at the gate. There was a wall around Jerusalem, and it was at one of the gates. And so it had already left, and that, so this is God's way of saying, my glory, which is his presence, has already left the, the when they went, they had the tabernacle, it was like a tent, a mobile chapel, if you would, and then when Solomon came along, he built the temple, which took that tabernacle or tent design, and on the Temple Mount, he designed the temple. And when, on the day that they dedicated the temple, the glory of God appeared above the temple and came down and rested on the temple. But now, with, when Ezekiel starts picking up this vision, we see that it, it's, it's at the gate. And so when you we cannot kind of like when you turn the television on in this vision, God is already he's at the door and he's he's leaving town and he and he and the next few chapters mention the glory of God and it's farther farther away. Now, let me say this in in application in just a few words. We're not going to read much. There's so much to read in Ezekiel, and uh, so we're gonna. If you've read read your your lesson from the quarterly, you've seen that what is being given is a stern message of judgment and yet encased within it is, is hope. Hope of a, a, if God says, if I'm doing this, uh, you know, my parents always 
maybe not in words, but in my on my parents were always saying, I, "I'm gonna, we're, you, you've got to stay in your room, or I'm going to spank you, or or you have to do these chores, extra chores as punishment." And, and they were trying to say, I, "I'm not just punishing you to hurt you or to be mean. I, I'm trying to, you. I'm trying to teach you something. Teach I'm, I'm trying to help you." This, I don't, I'm not just doing this because I enjoy making you unhappy. I mean, sometimes I thought, you, you won't let me go out with my friends. You just don't want to let me have any fun. Well, that's, that's not it at all. Your parents want you to have fun. Uh, you, you just, uh, everybody else is going to be at the party, and I'm not going to be there. Well, it, you know, there's a reason, a purpose. And, and they're not. The parents don't sit around saying, what, what can we do to make them unhappy or miserable today? Don't. Completely from a Christian perspective, let me wrap this up by saying this. We really can't look into the prophecy of Ezekiel and say this is the way God is, or this is the way God does, or this is the way God interacts with his people and, and draw from us. This is the way God is with us today. But let me say, the people of Israel were unique. They were specially selected. And a lot of the, that's a, that's a, a strong solution to a lot of the, uh, you know, for instance, let me get some, like, maybe sound left. There, there, are, there are verses of scripture in the Bible that say, don't put markings of tattoos on your skin. Don't eat shrimp. Don't eat pork, and we need to come along and say, you know, all of that, were, they were those were laws and commandments that God was giving to Israel for a specific time, for a specific reason. reason. Yeah. We don't have, in, in our church today, we don't have priests nope. or high priests. Now, of course, the Catholic Church, they have felt the necessity to have priests, but you will not find uh, there were Jewish priests mentioned in the Gospels, but when the church is founded, no one was ever designated a priest. We don't have priests. A priest was someone who stood between man and God who, who brought the two together. But Jesus tore all that down. Uh, Jesus is our high priest now. So, uh, the history of Israel, we see God allowing thousands of the Israelite people being carried away to Babylon. And they were going to be, every one of them were going to be slaves. Every one of the serfs were going to be sold and parceled out. It was going to put money in the coffers of the government. That's what government does. It always has. It seems to be very harsh. It seems to be very severe. The Babylonian captivity and the tragedy that is told about or chronicled here in the book of Ezekiel, God felt that he had to go to this severe measures or there would never be Christmas. <laughs> He's saving Christmas. Would make a good Hallmark movie, perhaps. Uh, if you look at the book of Ruth, there was a tremendous famine in the land. And people were starving to death. The family of Elimelech said, we've got to get out of here, go to find some food. And they went down to Moab. Elimelech's sons married Moabite women. One of them was a Moabite woman named Ruth. Elimelech and his sons died. They got sick and died. It's just a tragic story. Naomi, his wife, says, well, I might as well just, everybody I love is dying. I'm just going to go back to Bethlehem, that's their, their hometown. And her daughter-in-law, Ruth, says, well, I'll just go back with you. And, and Naomi says, no, just stay here with your people. Your mom and daddy's here, your family. She says, no, please don't ask me to leave you. And, and so Ruth came back. She married Boaz, and they had a son. And their son had a son whose name was Jesse. And Jesse had a son whose name was David. <coughs> David was the king of Israel. And it's through that Davidic line 
That's when the Gospel of Matthew starts out. It, he wants to prove to you that Jesus was related through his mother and through his father to David. The Messiah is going to be a continuation, the eternal establishment of the Davidic throne. Jewish people would accuse us of, of damaging the scriptures, but it seems this is what God's doing. He needed a family. <clears throat> he needed a family for a baby to be born into. You can't just have a baby just pop out of the sky. You've got to have a family. Well, Jesus' family was the Jewish people. Now, let me close with this. There were thousands of people who were kidnapped and dragged as slaves to Babylon. The people who were left behind thought, well, God has been kind to us. We were left behind. That's not the story at all. In this book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is going to travel to Babylon. He's going to be a part of the ones that were captured. We'll read about Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're slaves in, in Babylon. It's odd, you know, great armies and great governments and empires of the past, they just come in and they just lay a place waste and they kill everybody, take all of their goods. It's very odd, very strange that the Babylonian people, their armies came down and they would bring back thousands of people with them. When they had won a victory, they took prisoners Actually, the grace of God and the goodness of God was upon those people who were taken away. You wouldn't think that the people who were kidnapped were the people that God was actually saving them. But he did. When he took them out, the armies that next returned to the land of Judah and Jerusalem and, and uh, Judea, they just, it was awful. There was hunger and starvation it was just devastation. It was almost, everything was almost turned to rubble. But the people who were living in Babylon were living very lavish lives by comparison. They were at least were fed and clothed. Here again was not God's way of saying, see, slavery is a very good thing. No, it's all very bad. But God used, you know, even Joseph in the story, he, he talked to his brothers. He said, you know, you sold me into slavery, and you intended evil, but God meant it for good. And the captivity of Israel had been prophesied. They were going to be there for 70 years. But in, it was those people whom Cyrus sent back, and Cyrus just gave them baskets of gold and silver. And he said, go back and rebuild. And when the people came from the north, when they came from Babylon, all of these slaves returning from captivity, they came down there. They had the only means, the only materials. They had the only ability. They were the only ones in the world who could actually come down and rebuild Israel. And it was because of their prior captivity. When they came, when they came back down, we read in the book of Nehemiah that they rebuilt the wall. And then in Ezra, they rebuilt the temple. Because Cyrus, a pagan king, financed it all. I, I can't look at this and say, well, that's what God is doing in your life and my life today. I said, no, this, this is a historical oddity. This is something unique. And the thing, I think, of the theme all the way through is, is that God preserved what the Old Testament began to call a remnant, a remaining group. He hid these people and kept them safe, but all so that he could preserve the Jewish people and their history, because eventually a babe had to be born in, in Bethlehem that would be the Savior of the world. And I believe that what we're, we could look at, the, at Ezekiel and say, God is saying, no, I, I'm, he was showing his disapproval, and he brought judgment upon his people. But uh, it was upon Israel. And what was happening, I think the reason 
the Jewish people have been under attack for their entire history is because God chose them to be the purveyors of the line of Jesus. Just like when Herod tried to kill all the newborn children, he was trying to destroy Jesus. It's always been that way. And uh, the greatest fallacy of all, and it seems to me to still be uh, unfathomable, that Satan thought that if he killed Jesus, that that would be the answer to his problem. But Jesus came to die. So the death of Jesus was actually the God's greatest victory. It all sounds very counterintuitive. It all sounds like, oh, that, that doesn't make sense. God says, exactly. And that's what God is doing. So if you, are, if you become as I am, it's often mystified by what's going on in the book of Ezekiel. Just look at, you can see that God was uh, working to historically preserve that people, just a just a small portion of them, so that he could he, he kind of took them off the playing board. They were safer in Babylon than they were in their own homes, and God was with them there. All right, sounds like they've got some Christmas music going in the sanctuary. Let's head in that direction. Thank y'all for being here today. Like that Johnny Gamble is watching this morning. Good morning, Johnny. I, I don't know if you still around the Scottsboro area. There's Cleo. Clyde Higdon. Clyde Cleo. We call him Cleo. Let me see who all is here. Donna Sert is watching. Karen and Ronnie Reeves, it says. I don't know if it's one or both. There's Lacey. Good to see y'all. I'm headed to the sanctuary, just looking at some of the waves right here. I thought I saw another. There's Amy. 